Paul Shepherds. I'm the founder and CEO of We Build Bots. We Build Bots are a, um, an AI and analytics company that deliver a product called IntelliAgent, which is um, an automation platform for customer services. So we use chatbots, voice assistants, and analytics to um, help improve customer services. Um, I founded uh, a social media agency back in 2010, having worked in digital communications for some large financial services companies. Um, uh, a large proportion of what we did was to manage the customer service channels across Facebook, Twitter, etc. Um, for some quite large corporates. In doing so, we recognised just how repetitive in nature manual customer services are. And at any one point, we probably had 15 to 20 people answering um, a lot of the time the same questions. So we started to build some rudimentary internal web apps just to expedite the process, um, make our internal processes more efficient. And having seen the kind of results of that, decided that um, it was probably a product that we might be able to take to market. So we really began to kind of productize over the years between sort of 2016, 2017, and then we span out to WeBuild Bots um, mid 2017, and the product um, Intel Agent was kind of put out to the market. Coo Media is the agency. Um, it kind of still is in existence to this day. And um, I mean, Coo actually became an incubator for quite a, a couple of things that, uh, that I've gone on and launched. So apart from doing the social media marketing for, for large corporates, um, we acquired the OI Conference, Online Influence Conference, which was a social media conference and strategically it fitted with um, what we were doing so we sponsored it one year and then acquired it um, went on to scale that to be kind of two and a half thousand delegates one of Europe's fastest growing tech conferences um, I also co-founded an analytics company called Hello Soda which has now gone on to probably 40 45 people offices in uh, Manchester Austin Bangkok raised kind of 10 million dollars um, so Coo became, as much as a, an agency, it kind of became a platform through which I could try different things and launch different companies or co-found different companies. Um, so WeevilBots was kind of one of those. Now, whereas with the other companies, we would kind of co-found and I would step away once the management team had, had got to a certain size. Um, WeevilBots is a bit more of kind of a pet project because it was born genuinely from stuff that we were doing within the agency. So. Um, that's kind of my main focus right now and that's something that we hope to to build to kind of 100 million plus if we can over the next five years. I launched Coo Media because my role in financial services um, with Lloyds Banking Group and then Principality here in Cardiff um, was largely me managing agencies so I got to know the industry quite well, got to know kind of pricing models, got to know um, a lot about how kind of agencies deal with, with their clients. So I decided that I could probably do that and then set out to, to start the agency. Having seen as well, um, there was quite, a, quite an adoption of social media um, within businesses. I spent some time in the States and saw that, that kind of trend happening as well. So sort of thought that we could probably build an agency based solely around um, business use of, of social media. So in terms of um, how I actually started, my um, wife, girlfriend at the time, fell pregnant with our, with our second child. <clears throat> and I'd had this idea that I wanted to, to, to do something on my own. Um, and I hadn't made the decision um, at this point but I took two weeks paternity and just got used to waking up later and, and kind of getting on with some work while doing other things and, and I thought I really like this, I like this, this kind of doing things 
when I want to do them and how I want to do them and I'd work late nights instead of early mornings and um, so I never actually went back <laughs> after paternity. I um, just called my boss and said I'm, I'm not coming back and they were fine actually. In fact they gave me our first kind of big contract so um, it worked out well but yeah the family were a bit shocked and worried because we didn't really have many mortgage payments in the bank or anything but it, it worked out okay. Juggling the, the work-life balance is a challenge in the early days but the thing that I loved about it was you, you do work long hours but you're not tied to when those hours have to be put in all the time anyway so I found that um, I quite enjoyed working late into the night and early evening early into the morning when um, people were kind of outside of work so I could do big chunks of work when it was kind of deathly silent and, and I really had some some real headspace um, and then the day times I could help out with with my newborn kind of little lad and um, you know do little little tasks around the house and then obviously with mobile phones as well and emails on phones um, you're never really out of touch so if you do need to do something at a point in time that you weren't planning on doing it it's not a problem you can just duck back to the house or you know let someone know that you'll be on it in the next kind of hour or something like this so um, I mean I just loved it I, I loved it and um, it is hard work um, from a time and, and the work that you put in also from you know a stress perspective I suppose when in the early days when you're kind of wondering where the next contracts coming from the next piece of business but um, in terms of um, the pros and the cons of creating that, that life work balance for me um, I, I just wouldn't change it for the world in terms of lessons that, that I've learnt um, along the way I kind of used to pride myself on um, not planning and, and being a little bit flighty about things and taking opportunities when they come along and um, and there's definitely a lot to be said for being opportunistic and, and spotting a gap in the market and, and really going for it. Um, but I've definitely learned that if you can map out um, where you want to be, how you're going to get there, even if it's complete finger in the air stuff and stuff that you deviate from within the first kind of month or two, um, I've learned that, that planning is quite important and then as the businesses became bigger and we went to raise financing um, you know the first thing you're asked for is and it's understandable is a, is, a, is a business plan and your forecasts and um, I've actually grown to really really love that side of stuff whereas before I would just push it to the side and, and you know I'd, I'd kind of um, as I say pride myself on the fact that you know I haven't got a business plan I'm just sort of winging it kind of thing and that, get, that gets you so far and then when you really want to start building a serious business and, and employing more people and you know talking to kind of institutional investors and then you need to you need to be prepared to, to put some hard yards into the planning um, so yeah I would say just take that on board early and and, and plan I think when you're trying to convince someone to invest, uh, effectively a stranger to give you money, um, a story helps a lot. So for us it helped a lot to be able to say that this product idea has come from our own experience of recognising the inefficiencies of customer service because we were those inefficient kind of people working in a very manual way. Um, that helps a lot because it shows that you've experienced the kind of pain of, of what you're about to try and try and solve. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for chemistry. Uh, I think you need to appreciate that you are asking for money and, and be humble about it and um, take on board any reservations. We we had quite a few people. Um, 
question our valuation of, of the company, certainly if, if we build bots. Um, we rationalised that valuation, we accepted what they said, but we went back to them and we explained why we thought our valuation was, was accurate, um, and ultimately we got that valuation. So I think a lot of that was around not kind of digging our heels in and, and, and not getting our backs up when someone says we don't think your company is as valuable as, as you think it is. Um, I think you need to kind of brace yourself, accept it, take it on board, go away, think about it. And, you know, I'm sure at times people are right about, about valuations um, and reducing valuations. But if you really believe in what you've said, then spend a lot of time to explain why and then go back. Um, so I think some humility because you are asking for their money. Um, the idea has to be a good one. The market fit has to be a good one. And then if you can prove that you've experienced the um, realities of, of, of what you're trying to solve, or the, the issue that you're trying to solve, then I think that goes a, a long way too. There's always a, a balance then between um, the doubts that are, are being sown by, by people questioning your, your business um, and the self-confidence that you have to have if you truly believe in, in, in your idea. For me, it came from the sheer market size and, and the research that we had done. As I say, this was a, an area that we knew quite well because we dealt with a lot of customer service channels anyway. Um, add to that the kind of the growth and the statistics around AI, chatbots, um, analytics has always been something that we've been quite strong in as a, as a company with um, the agency anyway. So you, as I say, you take on board the kind of the, the doubts that have been presented to you and um, you cross reference those again with your knowledge of the sector. Um, the statistics, um, the analysts, what they're saying about the sector, and you make a you make a judgment call. And I think there's an element of, um, I guess, pig-headedness in terms of I just feel that this is right, but I think that needs to be backed up by by some fairly solid research. And and that's what we did. the The, the market was at the start of. Um, quite a kind of growth curve. We had experience in, in what we were doing. Um, we had clients that we knew we could go back to and, and sell this pro product into. So we started from a fairly robust platform. So when we were questioned, um, some of the questions weren't necessarily valid and were born from a misunderstanding of the sector. Um, some of them were valid, and they just they just make you um, reevaluate what you're what you're kind of proposing. Um, some of them made us change certain ways of doing things. Some of them even fed into new product developments. Um, but yeah, we we never really had too much of a doubt that that this was a sector that was worth launching into. It's a competitive space, it's a really exciting space, uh, it's a fast growing space. So we do have to kind of keep innovating, try and keep ahead of the competition. Um, we've got a, a huge, what we call a, an ice box of ideas and of product developments that um, are constantly being kind of rolled out into, into the product. We also take the learnings from the sectors that we go into, so we've had some really good traction in the public sector, local authorities. So um, certainly in terms of AI, the training that we can do for our, our AI based on that sector is really quite a strong proposition because the more clients we win in that sector, the more data we're collecting, the more we can train our AI and our natural language processing on terms specific to that sector. So we're really leveraging that um, 
machine learning aspect to keep ahead of the competition and to, to really deep dive into the public sector right now actually because we can legitimately say that um, the platform, the chatbots, the voice assistants that we're delivering are we believe more intuitive than much of the competition because we've gone so deeply into a sector we've leveraged the data from that sector and we've poured it back into the into the product so that's one element um, we've stumbled into another sector which is really exciting which is the sports fan engagement sector whereby um, you just flip out customer service for, for fan engagement um, we're helping fans buy tickets buy merchandise vote for kind of man of the match um, understand how to get to certain stadiums um, and a whole host of, of, um, of functionalities that that makes um, a football or sports fans life easier and helps clubs to engage so um, that's a really innov innovative step forward that we kind of didn't plan for but um, we started working working with an Italian football club AS Roma one of the biggest in Europe um, and that's led to a, a whole host of, of interest from the likes of um, UEFA, um, WRU and um, um, Brooklyn Nets and, and clubs from right across the world so that's a really exciting space that we're starting to go into and um, it's an example of I guess how we're ready to innovate for, for any sector if we can see a, see a gap. When we talk about um, growing a, a global client base, as we have, um, so we're working with Amnesty International, as I say, um, AS Roma, we've worked with some um, Dutch media groups. As far as um, how we've done it and advice that I would, I would offer people for, for what it's worth is, um, don't be scared to do it. We are a, we are a Welsh company. Um, I've got experience of um, working in America and I have a, another company that has offices in America um, and there's no kind of real trick or, or, or magic formula I think if you've won clients wherever you've won clients if you've done a good job for them then leverage those kind of clients and the case studies and the success stories and put them in front of people that are in America or are in different countries. We do a lot of stuff multilingually, so we're able to use that as a um, as a, a bargaining chip, I guess, when we're talking to European clients or would-be European clients. Um, for me, I, I just think good business is good business, and a good product and good people are good people, and um, most people can see that whether they're UK, Welsh. American, European, so <clears throat> I think the principles are, are, are the same. I think once you're out in America, for example, and dealing with people, then um, certainly there's you can be a bit more bullish about things. Um, the whole kind of British self-effacing humour doesn't always wash. They want to know how you can help them and how they can help you. So I think you can afford to be a bit more aggressive with things. Um, you know, but any country you go to, there's going to be slight cultural differences in terms of how you do business. But in terms of just getting yourself in front of them and, and initially winning that business or winning those opportunities, then there's nothing stopping anyone really. You know, with the internet now and LinkedIn, and um, if you've done a good job for someone, then get them shouting about it, and then go and show people wherever you want to work. Balancing the opportunities is, is a really interesting one actually because we are in a space that is applicable across pretty much any sector. Uh, just now we're working across the sporting sector, automotive, charity, utilities, retail, leisure um, and public sector and we were in real danger actually of, of just going after every single opportunity and um, not necessarily becoming specialists in any particular sector. Now, we mentioned earlier it's a competitive landscape and it's way more competitive if you're trying to do all of that stuff. 
So we have made a conscious de decision to look at our sales data, things like clients we have, length of sales cycle, average order value, um, stickiness of certain clients, and then we've made a call and we've said, right, for the next 12 months we are completely focused on the public sector and local authorities. So I think we had to do that as a team of, there are 16 of us now, so we're not big enough to go and build divisions for sports, divisions for charities, divisions for utilities. So um, I do think there's something to be said about um, doubling down on, on a sector and positioning yourselves as complete specialists in that sector. Now, the public sector isn't a kind of the sexiest um, market in the world, but for us, it's actually one that, that's borne some really good clients and, and been quite fruitful. And um, it means now that we can talk about our, our, um, our platform being very, very geared up for public sector and local authorities and that will then lead us into um, the NHS and other kind of blue light um, organisations. So yeah, I think it has to be a conscious decision if you want to scale a business um, almost outside of the main competition because otherwise we are coming up against IBM, Oracle, Salesforce whereas actually now that we're um, very specifically in the in the public sector, then um, we can start to, to start to push a much more targeted message out there. And then the sports stuff that I talked about, that's just um, that's kind of a sideline. And if it really takes off, then we will set up a separate division. But at the moment, um, we've made a conscious decision to go into one sector and, and try to become complete specialists in that, in that sector. So some of the um, contributing factors for for being a Welsh business and for um, retaining our headquarters here in Wales um, are we know the market quite well. Um, there's the kind of pride of, of, of being a Welsh person anyway. Um, family and, and friends are here. I get to travel quite a lot anyway with with the job and I always have with with other jobs that I've had so I kind of feel that I can scratch that itch of, of, of um, wanderlust anyway um, and then you know since we've started really scaling here in Wales um, DevBank have been really good we are down at Tramshed which is a great location um, we're kind of front and centre at Tramshed as well and we're taking bigger and bigger offices so we really feel um, part of the kind of part of the culture there. Um, talent is is sometimes a challenge but when you find the right people they tend to be quite quite loyal as long as you can give them the kind of job um, that the, the interesting work that, that, that we can. It's more economical um, and I mean, on a sunny day, it's it's a it's a it's a beautiful country to, to be in. I think mentoring um, is something that can be super helpful for people who are um, probably younger than me, to be honest, and who are wanting to set out and maybe learn from the mistakes that have already been made by a mentor, I think that could be really, really useful. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for kind of making mistakes and learning from the mistakes because they're the lessons that you really, really do learn and, and you don't forget. Um, however, if you can um, find a mentor who um, can keep you away from maybe some fatal mistakes for your, for your business and help you get to where you want to be a bit more quickly. Um, mentors typically are quite well connected, so if and when you do come to need to raise finance or um, need certain doors knocked on and, and, and opened for you, then I think mentoring in that um, respect is, is really, really useful. 
I do feel that the the term kind of needs to be quite clearly defined because um, I do feel that <coughs> people like to be called mentors and then actually might not appreciate how much time that 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 takes and and you know if, if you're putting yourself forward to be a mentor for someone um, then I think it's only fair that that person ex can expect to get some of your time and some of your attention um, so I think in theory it's it's brilliant mentoring is brilliant and people who give their time up is 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 always to be commended um, unfortunately I, I think there's there's a bit of a badge of honor around mentoring that, that is worn um, that is worn more readily than the actual mentoring is is given and people like to be called mentors and then sometimes don't don't fulfill the, the role of a mentor um, and that's a shame but on the whole I think it, it's, a, it's a really good theory and a good scheme and if you can get a good mentor then I've never officially approached a mentor or be mentored, um, but there's 100% people that I surround myself with and I work with, um, and I even kind of hang around with who, who inspire me and who have achieved things that I look to aspire. Um, and I quite often ask their advice. Um, but it's typically over a, over a pint or on a kind of uh, a boys trip or something. Um, one guy in, in particular is 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 um, has done really well over in the states, and quite often ask um, ask his advice on on hiring out there and and um, office locations and things like like this. So even though it's not kind of officially mentoring, there's definitely people that I kind of seek advice and and um, from and, and and I guess look up to. tips that uh, that I guess I wish I'd known at the start uh, I, I do think planning I do think get into the habit of, of planning um, and researching your market um, jot down every single idea um, it's a bit kind of Alan Partridge but even to this day um, I will always record at least two or three voice notes a day and Mostly I'll listen back and think what the hell was I talking about But just every now and then something will come along and, and you dig a little bit deeper and it actually turns out to be a, a Good idea. So there's no harm in just capturing that that stuff um, as it pops into your head um, I Would say depending on the kind of business and whether you need it um, Identify very quickly if you do need money if you do need capital to to grow and to scale because Bootstrapping is great, um, but if you've really got a good idea and the market is ready for that that product or that idea, then you should try and get out to the market quite quickly and at scale. So, um, if you can bootstrap a, a, a kind of a concept or um, minimal minimum viable product, um, then do that, get it to market, prove the concept, and then go and raise some cash. Because once you've done that, um, things don't become easy, but things become easier, and then other opportunities arise, and you've got some money to, to do stuff with, and you can hire people. And for me, I think uh, I probably didn't do that soon enough with the agency, um, but I took that learning into uh, Hello Soda, and I took it into Weibo Bots, and we very quickly went to market to, to raise money um, and that helped us scale way more quickly than, than we were able to um, without without funding so if there's a need for it identify it prove that you're worth it and, and, and go and get it I think always try to, to keep a sense of perspective there will be times when it feels like everything's going wrong and, and things come in waves and you'll get a VAT bill and you'll get one of your team come in and say they want to leave and something else will happen and you'll get home and you'll just think wow what what actually went on today and um, 
I'm a big believer in 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 taking a breath and and if you've got five minutes to to meditate or even just close your eyes and just try and reset everything um, look at what you have got not what you haven't got and go again the next day because um, what I found is very soon after one of those days comes a day when contracts land something else happens you're invited to this great event and and you get home and you think what a day so um, just try and balance all of that stuff because um, you know it, it's a bumpy ride and um, yeah you just need to keep a sense of perspective I think and I, that's, that's, that's helped me greatly I don't see it as a discipline I, I see it like that for me is the most exciting part of what I do is taking a, a, a germ of an idea and sitting with a huge piece of paper and scribbling and linking things together and when you're doing that other ideas come and um, validating those ideas and yeah I mean in my in my in my most sort of frenzied hour I'm, I'm I've got a calculator I've got a laptop where I'm googling stats I've got a pen and a paper where I'm jotting stuff down um, and like, time just disappears when I'm when I'm doing that kind of stuff so um, yeah I don't I don't discipline myself to, to do that um, I just feel if I've got to do it I'll do it and I'll most likely call into the office and just um, I'm working at home today because um, I've got stuff to get on with and yeah I mean f that for me if I could just do that all day every day and then just pass it on to the next person then that would be perfect um, the hard part then is is in the execution and that's where things get a bit more real and a bit more mundane I guess but um, the idea development side of things um, in fact I, I definitely have to stop myself from doing it as opposed to discipline myself to do it um, so yeah and I'm kind of storing them up because I figure if I exit this company I've got at least five or six other things I could go and do after a stint on the beach <laughs> in terms of um, a board and the formalities of, 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 of a business uh, I think it's quite important I never used to and there's a theme running through sort of my professional career from um, scally to slightly more corporate kind of person. Um, I think that's just kind of come with age. But yeah, we've, we've, we have a board, um, both um, Hello Soda, which I'm, I'm very little to do with right now, but um, there's a board there and we will box, we, we have a board and I mean, I find it incredibly useful because it's it's one forum where you can just blurt out everything, the good and the bad. Um, on that point, I, I, I think a board is useful if you're willing to be completely honest with them and ask them for help or ask for their opinions. I don't think a board is any good if they're going to sit around and nod and if you're only going to tell them the good stuff that's going on. Um, they've got to be a very robust sounding board for the good and the bad in the business um, and yeah for me it's a it's it's a chance every month to just kind of almost overspill everything and then go back to the office empty and fill up for the next month and um, it's really useful and we actually report to, to cedars as well so through cedars we've got like 400 small investors and they love the updates and we're quite candid in those updates too we need to be a little bit um, restrictive around numbers and, and some of the more commercially sensitive information but we quite often say a developer's just left um, something's happened and feedback has been great people have come back and said um, thankfully first of all the they're positive updates financially we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction but um, they're really kind of um, appreciative of the fact that we're quite open and, and we'll say that the lowlights as well as the, the highlights so I think 
using a board in that way is 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 what they're there for and um, if you can do that then I would suggest it's a useful um, forum. <laughs>